save for your own return. Ah! I haven't watched this, by the way. I just skipped ahead, like, around to see what the general gist was, you know? Because from the title here... Because... What I was expecting from the title of this video, National Debt, Who Cares, was them, like, saying, Ah, it doesn't fucking matter if there's national debt, whatever. You know? Um... And that was really confusing to me because that doesn't fit with, like, the preconceptions that I have for the views that PragerU is paid uh, to propagandize. So, let's give it a look-see. In the 1958 oh. movie The Blob, starring a young Steve McQueen... Oh, shit. Okay, first off, look at this. They've upped their clip art. Look at the, look at the detail on this face. Hmm. Naturally, the man gets more face shading than the woman. Typical patriarchy, I know. Looks better, though. A giant expanding mass, a blob, threatens to destroy an entire town and everyone in it. It keeps growing and growing and no one can stop it. The United States debt is like that blob. Because it's big and it's getting bigger? Plastic in the Ocean is like the 1998 80s movies The Blob. Because it gets big. The online furry community is like The Blob. Beca because it gets bigger. The you, could ju you could just use this to describe literally anything that's getting bigger. Okay, alright. We gotta make it sound scary though. And I would love, and I cannot wait for PragerU, purveyor of all things war, to explain to me how the national debt is a problem. Let's, let's do ourselves some little, uh, some home finance education. Unlike the fictional blob, it threatens to destroy more than an entire town. Oh, it shit. threatens the entire nation. Oh, shit. Where is Steve McQueen when you need him? Fuck, Steve McQueen? Where the fuck you at? Here are some numbers. The national debt currently stands at $22 trillion. That's trillion with a T. Yeah. Ten years ago, it was $10 trillion. Amazing. Ten years from now, it's projected to be $34 trillion. Wow. The interest payment on our debt is currently $300 billion per year, mm -hmm. heading towards a projected $1 trillion within a decade. Mm -hmm. At that point, a fifth of all federal taxes will go towards the interest on the debt. Not education, infrastructure, and defense. Wait. <laughs> Wait, you can't mention education and infrastructure as examples of where federal money should be going if you don't advocate for them going there. You slimy little fucking weasel. Let Look at them slip on by. Prager, you does video after video. Oh, pr oh, what if we just privatize the education systems? Too much. The federal bloat paying back student loans. <laughs> and then here in this video, they're like, here at PragerU, we are deeply concerned as to where our federal tax dollars are going. They should be going towards education, but instead, like, nah, fuck off, dude. You know, the stuff government is supposed to do. Oh, and yeah. And that's with historically low interest rates. Imagine if those rates normalized. Well, maybe you don't want to imagine it because that picture is very dark. What is with this guy's face? Is this guy an actor? Wait, look at what he's doing. Government is supposed to do. Look at his eyes. Wait, what the fuck? In infrastructure look at him. and defense. You know, the stuff government is supposed to do. And that's with historically low interest rates. Imagine if those rates normalized. Well, maybe you don't want to imagine it because that picture is very dark. Is this guy on the casting couch? Why the fuck is he overacting his facial expressions? This shit is so disconcerting. I don't know, like, maybe when I think of, like, political commentator, apart from people like me, obviously, I think of, like, I think of, like, like a newscaster or something where they sit there and they look level and they're like, here's the fact. But this guy is like, look at the face he's making at me right now. In a better world, voters would be marching on Washington demanding that our politicians dig us out of this hole before we're buried in it. Oh, Okay. I mean, they did. There was a ton of protests to the Trump tax cuts, where there were a bunch of taxes cut for middle-income and high-income American citizens without any accompanying uh, cuts in government spending, which substantially increase our deficit. Wait for me. Nope. You're mean. Okay, fuck off. My fucking girlfriend went to go buy some weed, and she was like, don't start without me. Fucking femoids.
fuck water is delicious. But like, wait, hold on. Let's let's get ahead of ourselves a little bit here. I can step ahead of this entire video, okay? For one, being in debt nationally is not necessarily a bad thing. And I'll get more into that later, I think. But also, the national deficit increases every single time a Republican is in office. I understand what they're doing here. Oh, we have to be fiscally conservative. We have to tighten our purse strings. No more federal government spent blah, 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 blah. If they actually cared about this, even an iota, even slightly, they would support policies which do not increase the national deficit. Like, for example, stop cutting taxes on the wealthy, close corporate loopholes, stop spending more money on the military. It's really, really not necessary. And you can engage in cost-saving measures preventatively, too. By reforming our um, health care system, uh, we would actually increase the average health of the population, which would mean that there are less emergency room visits and less extremely costly uh, Medicare and Medicaid-supported treatments that have to go on into perpetuity, which might have been treated more easily and more uh, uh, cheaply had they gone in for pre preventative care earlier on. This is a really big problem. If you're poor and you can't afford a trip to a doctor, you're not going to go to them about this bump on your leg. You'll think like, whatever, it's a bruise or a dent or whatever. I'll get out of that. And a month and a half later, when it's starting to hurt and swell and leak a viscous purple fluid, um, at that point you think, okay, debt it is. You go to the doctor, and the doctor says, boy, this sure sucks. If only you had come in a month and a half ago, we would have been able to treat this much easier and for much less money. See, there are a lot of things that you can do to reduce government spending, but that is not what PragerU is interested in. PragerU is interested in tightening up government spending when it comes to things that actually benefit people's lives, like welfare, or education, or medical care, and PragerU is very much not in favor of tightening the government's purse strings when it comes to building a larger military, giving tax cuts to the wealthy, allowing Wall Street to get away with all the tax loopholes they use to avoid paying back into the economy that subsidizes their shenanigans. So that's the, that's the, that's the fun little game here. Maybe we'll get to talk a little bit about how the debt isn't necessarily a bad thing. In the real world, Almost no one cares. That's not true. But we should care. We And okay. any thinking person, left or right, understands why. No individual and no nation can accumulate debt indefinitely. I Europe despise was able to face. bail out Greece with some loans a few years ago. But Greece is a small country. If the U.S. goes boom, there's going to be no one to bail us out. So what's driving the debt? And more importantly, oh, how do we drive ourselves out of it? Baby. The debt has been growing for decades. It got supercharged by the 2008 recession. You know, for a very short time, and for the first time in, like, centuries, America was actually running a budget surplus. Do you know which president that was under? It was under President Clinton. And then George W. Bush came on. Now listen... I'm not a big fan of the Democratic Party either, okay? I'm just saying that the hawkish policies that are purportedly small government conservatism do nothing to lower the deficit. Absolutely nothing. Revenues fell while spending soared. Under President Obama, the debt doubled from $10 trillion to $20 trillion. In the first two years of the Trump administration, <laughs> we've added another $2 trillion. So what are we to do? For Blaming Obama for the increase in government debt, which took place in a financial crisis that didn't take place in his term, is a whew, 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 real slippy. You keep complaining debt with deficit. Please, dude, stop. No, I haven't. Debt is the total amount of money owed elsewhere. Deficit is the yearly amount you lose, the yearly amount that gets added to that debt. I don't believe I conflated those terms once. Yeah, Obama did bail out those corporations, but the tax codes and loopholes and 
lack of regulatory oversight that allowed the 2008 financial crash to happen. That's all Republican trickle-down economics, baby. That's all the deregulation that's been taking place for the past 50 years. Easy peasy. First, we need to identify the... Pri Asking Vosh to not make a mistake on something he doesn't understand. Is Whoa! Super fighting robot. Could you kindly, to avoid a ban, explain to me what factually incorrect statement I have th made thus far? I encourage you, please. It is for your benefit. Fucking little cuck boys. Primary source of the problem. It's... The video is talking about the debt, but you keep bringing up the deficit as if they're the same thing. Not as if they're the same thing! The deficit contributes the debt, you fucking idiot! You fucking numbskull! You troglodyte! You Neanderthal! What the fu- Oh, he's only talking about the debt and what policies increase it! What does that have to do with the deficit? Amazing. Pretty basic. You can talk about defense spending, welfare spending, or bloated budgets all you want, but it really comes down to two programs, Social Security and Medicare. Unless we get a handle on these monsters, the debt blob will continue to expand until it overwhelms us. I mean, I think the military is actually a pretty big one, don't you think? Can we... Yeah, so literally one half of our discretionary spending in 2017 went to the military. So there's a di so there's discretionary spending and non-discretionary spending. And non-discretionary spending refers to spending that's cut out of the budget which goes towards programs the government cannot that that they're obligated to put in, hence non-discretionary. Discretionary spending being all that juicy shit we make the choice to pay into. Stuff like the military, which contributes to literally one half of our discretionary spending. And as for non-defense, transportation, and then we've got education and employment services, vet benefits, which is, hey, you know, cut down in the military, cut down in the overseas wars a little bit. Maybe we could cut down on the vet department as well, huh? Income security, health, administration of justice, internal affairs, and then other takes up a good chunk. So for PragerU to be like, let's talk about the debt. Now, yeah, some people talk about the military. Okay. Social security. Nah, dude. Let's talk about the fucking military. Absolutely, let's talk about the military. I would love to talk about the military. Debt is money borrowed. Deficit is the difference between revenue and expenditure. You pay interest on debt. You don't pay interest on deficits. Super fighting robot. I know that. I never said otherwise. What the fuck? All right. I have to. I just have to remember. Anytime somebody in chat disagrees with me, it's because they are wrong. I never said that you pay interest on the deficit. You pay interest on a debt. How would you pay interest on a deficit? Absolutely. Amazing. All right. So anyway, for them to just throw military spending like out the fucking window... From the moment one? Mm, I don't know. According to data from the Congressional Budget Office, I'm ready. These two programs alone face a $100 trillion shortfall over the next three decades. How is that possible? Super Fighting Robot, I didn't ask what the difference was. I know the difference between debt and deficit, and I have never said I do not know. The other person was wrong to assume I did not know. I asked you what factually incorrect statement I have made. Well, for starters, you've got 74 million baby boomers rolling into retirement age. Fucking 10, boomers. 10,000 a day. 10,000 boomers a day. Fuck, dude. Can you imagine that? Out across the fucking streets of America, UPS is rolling up, delivering boomer licenses to 10,000 people a day. On top of that, Medicare recipients typically receive benefits that are triple the size of what they paid into the system. Without mm -hmm. some serious adjustments... To our medical system. Wait, did you just say serious adjustments to our medical system? Is that what I heard? You do realize the only reason medical care is so fucking expensive in this country is because we literally let insurance companies just scrape money off the top and add expense to the process while contributing literally nothing? What? Did you? Wait, I'm sorry. Did I? That are triple the size of what they paid into the system. 
without some serious adjustments to our medical system to ensure that they don't pay three times as much because insurance companies scrape off the top. These programs are going to fail. I agree. Thank you. We do need medical medical service reform. Man, Prager U. Prager U. Doing so much better than they used to. Thank you, buddy. Can I equalize the volume a bit? Who's too loud, me or the video? This is not the fault of retirees. Hey, Shu. It is simple demographics and math. Paying it's all the fault promised of the benefits retirees. would require either raising the payroll tax from its current 15.3% to 33%, or imposing a 34% national sales tax. Or? We reform the medical system because right now, our medical care is more expensive than and less effective than, for the average person, that which we see in other countries in Europe. So if we just improved something, it wouldn't cost so much. This is the, this is literally like, this is, okay, look, this is like a dude, a really generous dude who has a car, okay? And he, he runs a fucking, uh, what's good, Uber, okay? He's a fucking Uber driver, right? And he drives people around and he has the shittiest fucking the most broken down like 1962 cadillac it gets like seven miles to the gallon it's heavy and just for extra just for good measure he throws a bundle of bricks in the back just real this is just a fucking gas hog of a car okay just an absolute fucking nightmare and he drives he's an uber driver he's driving people all up and down the place and he's just spent he's just raking out that fucking money to gas just Blowing that shit right up. He's not making a profit. He's sinking deep into the red because the Uber car, it's not covering the fucking gas costs. And he looks at this. He looks at the situation he's got in front of himself and he says, fuck, I've got to start charging my drivers more. You buy a better car. You put down an initial investment and you get a car that doesn't run seven miles to the gallon highway and miraculously as if by a miracle the gas stops costing as much put me in prager you put me in prager you honestly find me one man at prager university who knows his stupid comparisons better than me no squeezing the rich slashing defense or eliminating welfare won't come close to paying the bill Wait, yeah, wait, eliminating defense would go like a huge way towards it. Okay, wait, what's your point? What's your point? Neither will any plausible level of economic growth. The $100 trillion hole is too big. So let's talk fairness. I would need to see the numbers on the $100 trillion hole. Um, I sincerely doubt, and without any numbers or sources being provided, they never provide sources in PragerU videos. Without numbers or sources being provided, I can't do the fucking quickie math myself. I am pretty sure that Social Security has not gotten so bloated that it is literally impossible to pay for it. I'm pretty sure we haven't reached that point. If mom and dad can't make the mortgage payment, they don't tell the kids to get full-time jobs to make up the shortfall. They move what? to a different house that matches their budget. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I agree. If the medical system that you're working with right now is so expensive that it doesn't, you don't tax people more, you get a better system. What? Prager you? Prager you? Yeah. Um, thanks. Wow. I could, I should have just waited a little bit, huh? I didn't even need to do the fucking Uber analogy. I could have just waited for you to demonstrate the flaw in your own fucking argument. Likewise, when America promises senior citizens benefits far exceeding what they paid into the system, we should not tell young working families that their taxes must be doubled or tripled. No, we should. No, we get a smaller house. What the fuck? And instead, pare back those benefits to an affordable level. That's only fair and sensible, right? But when it comes to the debt, neither of these qualities seem to figure in. So what can we do? More to the point, what can you do? First, <laughs> be sure to save for your own retirement. What the fuck? This video is so fucking all over the place. Okay, wait. So Social Security and Medicare 
are so expensive that nothing can pay for them. They're like a blob. It's impo- – wait. Okay, no. We have to go even further. The debt – is huge. It's huge. It's amazing. It's massive. And it's because of social security. Don't talk about the military expenditures. It's just because of social security and Medicare. And Medicare is really expensive for the boomers. And we don't know why. It has nothing to do with the insurance companies. Okay. So now that we have isolated the problem to not the military, but instead to these two social programs, there's nothing we can do. Now that we've isolated it, we realize there was actually nothing we could do at all. Except scale back the programs. Here, I will demonstrate why we need to scale back the programs by using an analogy that could be easily applied to explaining why we need to reform a medical care system for cost-saving benefits. And then, what can, what can we do? Oh, I don't know. What can you do? Have a change jar. What the fuck is this video doing? This is so all, I'm, I'm actually getting fucking whiplash. Usually Prager U videos are a little bit more consistent than this, but this is like, I guess you have to think of it, you have to think of it logically, okay? They're not trying to create a set of consistent arguments to, like, lay forth and make a point. They're trying to instill a certain set of beliefs in the mind of the person watching. Don't question the military. The military is fine. Our social programs are destroying the countries. We need smaller government. You need to personally save up money. That, like, that's the, that's like the mentality that we're trying to build here. It's not about making a cogent argument because the video was self-contradictory. Also, Shoe on Head, happy to see you in chat, comrade. Shoe on Head, you gotta respond to me on Twitter. Are we doing the fucking DNC debate, the, the primary debate live coverage? Are we dabbing on them live? Only if you wanna. I know you're much bigger than me. I'm small and weak. I'm just saying. Do not overly depend on a government that has promised more than it can possibly pay out to take care of you. <laughs> Second, tell Washington to get a spine and deal with Social Security and Medicare. See, again, it has no, no, wait, cutting tax, like increasing taxes in the wealthy, cutting out corporate tax loopholes, shh, lowering our military spending, shh, 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 shh. Social Security and Medicare. Hey, how many um, of the people who liked this video do you think are boomers? who don't realize that in, like, five years, their livelihood is going to rely on the success of Social Security and Medicare. Remember remember back during the Obama days when they ran that poll and, like, like a third of only, like, two-thirds of Americans were against Obamacare, but on the Affordable Care Act, it was, like, 50-50, and there were a bunch of people who were like, yeah, I'm in favor of the Affordable Care Act, but Obamacare? Fuck no. You remember that? That's the vibes I'm getting right now. People live a lot longer than they did when Social Security was first conceived in 1935. We need to gradually raise the Social Security eligibility age to reflect that. It's now 66. We need to get it to 68 and then 70. That's pretty straightforward. Medicare is trickier. I will admit, I have heard decent arguments on raising the social security threshold because we do on average live longer originally social security was meant to be a um like like not everyone was guaranteed to reach it you know and nowadays that's not necessarily the case of course nobody's guaranteed to reach social security age but still um but if that is to take place if the line is going to be drawn upward that would need to be accompanied with an increase in the livability of people approaching that age. Like, you shouldn't have to work until fucking 70, and then you get to live on a, like a starvation stipend for the rest of your life. That's fucked. Um, if the, if the, if the age was raised, then working conditions prior to that point would need to increase as well. But a good solution already exists. Oh. Amazingly, within the Medicare system. Oh, no. The prescription drug program. What? Almost unprecedented among government programs, this one has come in below initial projected costs. Amazing. Why? Because insurance companies have to compete for seniors' prescription drug business. So let's give seniors more options to shop around for the Medicare plans they want. I have literally no idea what this program is, but when I say the insurance companies are responsible for fucking the American healthcare system, I'm being very sincere with that with that statement, okay? 
I am being very fucking sincere. More choice and competition would stabilize costs no, I mean, no. and give us a fighting chance to keep Medicare solvent. <sighs> Insurance companies have been um, collaborating for a really long time to maintain a consistent increase in, um, in, in their rates like across the board. There's a reason why nowadays, like giving birth costs tens of thousands of dollars, um, whereas the per dot like the uh, accounted for inflation equivalent that it would have costed 50 years ago was a fraction of that there's a really big reason for that and it's not because i mean you'd expect as medical technology advances you would expect procedures to get cheaper that's how it seems to work right as time has gone on monitors have gotten better and cheaper this is actually a benefit of capitalism for the most part this the parts that it takes to put this thing together, not only would these parts not have existed a decade ago, but if they had, this would have been like a hundred thousand dollars because it's because the fucking GeForce RTX 280 Ti or whatever. I bet that that would have been like future tech to them, right? Ten years ago, and capitalism's good at that in some way. It makes things cheaper and more plentifully accessible. At least if you're not talking about necessities, but sometimes you have what is called a market failure. This is when the conditions surrounding a market or a commodity or a service do not lead to those outcomes. Rather than allowing things to become cheaper, more plentiful, more convenient for the consumer as different businesses compete, you have, well, market failures. A good example, ISPs, right? ISPs have what's called a uh, regional monopoly. So if you live in an area where the only place that you can get coverage is Suddenlink, like where I live, then if you were, say, a very handsome streamer, like me, you might have to settle for a really bad internet plan because it's the best thing they offer. There's no competition here, and there won't be, because the comparative cost advantage of another ISP setting up shop here wouldn't outweigh the... um uh, the amount that it would cost to like get invested in this area because there's already market saturation with Suddenlink. So this is what would be called a market failure. Capitalism and competition do not work to bring about the desired results for the average consumer. And healthcare and insurance works exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. Down to a T. See, there's something called... um uh, what's it called? Is it liquid? It's not liquidity. Fuck my, my economics terms are so, uh, not flexibility, not liquidity. Um, what's the term? It determines like, um, th the extent to which people are willing to like change the amount they're going to pay for an item. Uh, fuck elasticity. Yes. Um, right. Inelasticity. Thank you. Here's an excellent example. Okay. Imagine you're a, a fair milady, okay? You're a beautiful princess milady, and you've got a little, little fucking baby in your belly, okay? You need to give birth. That's happening. We don't even need to use that example because you can have an abortion prior. If you break a leg, you need to have that leg set. If your fucking appendix is about to explode, you need to get that shit removed. There are, like, a ton of things that can happen to your body. You don't get to, like, a choice. Very often, things happen so urgently, you can't even shop around for hospitals. And even if you could, what difference would it make? The prices are going to be pretty much the same at all the different hospitals because they all run through the same fucking insurance companies. And you can only get insurance in many cases through working at a job, meaning that not only is the pricing inelastic for medical, uh, medical services because you need it no matter what it's priced at, but... You don't even get an option to pick amongst competitors because usually you get your medical insurance through a job and that job, I mean, you, you aren't going to like, oh, hey, this job's good, but I need better medical insurance. Time for me to shop around. Nobody makes decisions that way. The job takes prescience. There are so many ways in which the insurance system in this country is fundamentally broken. How competition just doesn't produce the results we want. And we see this in the results because 
per capita and per procedure for the average American, American health care is worse and more expensive. In spite of the fact that the government isn't the one paying it, it is still more expensive to the government because there are economic downsides to the problems we have with health in this country. Medical insurance needs to be reformed in this country, flat out, period, hands down, easy peasy. This is a slam dunk argument from any field of study, sociology, economics, uh, psychology, medicine, easy slam dunk argument. The only people who disagree, insurance companies, their lobbyists, and the politicians they've gotten to. It's really that simple. It's like climate change. It's not really discussed in the academic fields. It's argued over in the political space. It's like a big game of theater. So are any of these ideas... Sorry about that rant. ...ideas being seriously discussed in the halls of government? We all know the answer to that question. Here comes the blob. I'm Brian Riedel, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Prager University. Wait, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan the Institute? Yeah, this is so wait, they this is who they brought in? A senior fellow at a conservative propaganda think tank? That's the best they could do? That's who they got for this? So not an economics professor, no. Not somebody who's actually educated on this issue. Just somebody who makes a lot of money distributing propaganda through a think tank. Nice. Amazing. You can always tell listen. There's always back and forth to be had on, this, on, the, on issues like this. You know, what exactly should we do? Social security is expensive, you know, like there are conversations to be had. But when the opposition, when people on the right, all of their opinions, all of their dogma, all of their arguments are coming from people with a financial investment in 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 their set of policies who are disseminating propaganda specifically oriented around promoting those policies it's like conservatives like being lied to i mean all of their propaganda comes from actual financed propaganda outlets funded by billionaires you know i'm not saying there's not fake news on both sides but like jesus fuck this is what they've got, you know? This is how conservatives take their marching orders. They, like, listen to a person who's a senior fellow at an institution that exclusively pushes for conservative financial policies and is funded by billionaires who benefit from those conservative financial policies. And then the conservatives look at it and they go, yes, yes, thank you for these facts, master. Please shit more of them onto my plate. I want, mm, yes. Oh, that's a bit of corn in my teeth. Mm. Ah, oh, yes, I love these unbiased facts you've given me. I will own the libtards with these. Thank you, master. Fuck me. <laughs> oh, God. Let me read donations real quick. <laughs>